Okay. Hello, everybody. It's me, Martin Cross, and I have an extra special guest on Cross's Corner today. It's the amazing Robbie Manson, world record holder in the men's single skulls, lit up the world of rowing. I was lit up the world of rowing for several years now. And uh, Robbie joins us uh, from New Zealand. Hey, Robbie. Hey, Martin. How's it going? Yeah, excellent. Fantastic. I'm so looking forward to talking to you. And uh, just kind of want to start off with um, how you're. Your week's been going. How your day's gone today? Yeah, it's um, we're in a fairly solid week of training um, this week, so um, the body's feeling it a little bit. And this morning, rode twenty two k in singles, and then uh, had a gym session. So um, yeah, that went reasonably well. And then went and rode my horse this afternoon, which was fun. That's um, amazing. Seen pictures of you on Instagram with your horse Baz. And and that's clearly bringing you a lot of pleasure getting out on, getting out on a horse again. Yeah, I absolutely love it. Um, yeah, it's the highlight of my days at the moment. And uh, this week, the big project has been making him some jumps. So um, I've made him a couple of jump stands and been painting poles for him. So we'll have some colourful yeah. things to look at in, in his arena soon. So, yeah, no, it's been really cool. You're obviously a pretty competent horseman. I, I just thinking, like jumping over horses. I'm thinking, is he, is he worried about falling off or anything like that? Well, I did actually fall off last weekend, but he, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I was uh, opening the gate and shutting it um, on his back, and he touched the electric fence and jumped sideways. So, I, oh wow! Well. But luckily, I was okay. Yeah, yeah, that, that's pretty cool. So, in your single session this morning, is that? Is is that just you and is it your doubles partner John Story or is there a whole bunch of you going out in singles? Uh, Chris Harris and the double, but um, uh, I was I thought you were around with John. Sorry, I got no, that. No, no, with um Chris, but um, so this morning there were three or four of us out in singles, and um, we all sort of have our own individual zones, so um, it's we're sort of out there training together, more or less side by side, but also working on our own. Um, individual things as well so um, it's sort of this morning <clears throat> split up into a few different waves and groups but um, for the most part of the last three months it's been the whole um, New Zealand men's squad uh, sweeping and sculling have been working together um, in singles and small boats and things so um, yeah it, it must be strange this kind of training because you're just coming into summer and it sounds like you're doing you know some some low intensity stuff you how how's the the training been since coming back in lockdown? How have how have the coaches phased it? Um, so it's actually been quite um, yeah, it's been quite a good block that that we've just had. Um, so we had I think about eight weeks of lockdown in total, and that was from uh, around April May. I think maybe the end of May, beginning of June, we came out of lockdown and had um, a month or so back on the water, and then we had a month completely away from the middle of June to middle of July. So we've been back s since the 13th of uh, July now. So I think, what's that, two or, th two or three months or so. But, um, yeah, so we've just been training as a men's squad. So everyone's been sort of mixing together, um, including the coaches. So we've had um, worked with all of the, the men's coaches, which has been really cool and um, refreshing and um, just sort of, um, I guess really to get morale up and to keep things fresh and interesting and because it is a, a really long year yeah um, going into Tokyo next year was sort of have really tried to um, I guess factor that into it yeah 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 so have you, have you done many pieces up at pace or uh, you know high intensity pieces or have you not had that fun yet in training no no as we've done a few sort of lower rate um competitive um and longer distance sort of pieces and training but um yeah it's mostly just been slow and steady um so far yeah and what have you made about the the news around the world in terms of the rowing world you know the europeans uh, probably happening in, in a couple of weeks time you know the germans and dutch h training full on and uh Ollie Zeidler just been in a training camp. I don't know about the, the Chinese who'll be your rivals, I think, for gold in um uh in, in Tokyo. Yeah. Yeah, I I guess it's um 
such a crazy time at the moment and you you never know quite what's gonna be just around the corner so um i think the fact that we can still train and keep some normality in what what we're doing is is really important and really helpful um i guess at the same time you've just got to be ready to roll with the punches and uh whatever life and covid throw at us next we've got to be um be there and ready so um yeah it's uh, it's cool to see the european champs hopefully going ahead soon and um it'll be good to watch some racing this year because yeah, yeah. it's such a long time with um yeah with not a lot happening in, in terms of racing and um yeah i guess it's, it's basically essentially a whole season just about that we've we've missed out on yeah now now you're in the double with with chris that's right yeah, yeah? So how yeah. did that come about? Because that was quite a decision for you after after saying you wanted to be in the single in Tokyo. Yeah, I guess the the end of last year, I just, I really wasn't enjoying it and I didn't have a very good 2019 season. I think I was sort of uh, front of the B final, uh, back of the A final, like throughout the, the whole season. So, um yeah, just, I guess I wasn't really um, enjoying it. I even thought about um, giving it away and then I was just sort of talking to a, a few different people and then realising that there's a real opportunity there in the double and um, both in terms of doing something that um, would keep it interesting and enjoyable, sort of having a, a teammate again, which I hadn't for the previous uh, three years, but um also the fact that chris and i um i know a, a really fast combination so yeah. um there was that sort of um excitement factor as well that um yeah really i i felt last um new zealand summer um so sort of from november onwards um like reinvigorated in a way and um i think both chris and i from that point on pb'd and all of our erg testing we did and um everything so we we were both in amazing shape uh going into what would have been the 2020 season oh, wow. the lockdown and everything happened so yeah 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 yeah. I think, in fact we both did exactly the same score on our 2k test to the the point one of a yeah. um of a are split you, so, are you allowed to say around about what that that was your 2k uh around about 550 i won't say exactly what it yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're both to the exactly the same point um zero of a um of a split and or a weekend and um both PB'd on our five K UG test at the beginning of the lockdown that we had here in New Zealand because we're obviously training on the UGs all the time. Yeah. Um, so we they they threw a five K UG test at us during that. So what's your preference, two K or five K? Um I'd say definitely 2K. Um, oh, really? Yeah, I don't tend to do well, – it's pretty hard to rate 40 for um, for 5K, isn't it? So, um, <laughs> Is that what uh, you call your 2K at? Do you do it at 40? Oh, yeah, around about. I think actually the PB that I, that I did at the beginning of this year, um, I think I actually rate a little bit lower um, for me, but it's generally around uh, 38 to 40 average finish in the um mid 40s i think and mate so what do you go over the 5k at i think around like maybe 32 rate or something oh so that's much more conservative yeah <laughs> um, I, was gonna, I, was gonna... Yeah, I feel like 2k is the right distance for me like i'm not um not explosive at all so the the real sprinty sort of stuff anything probably less than than 1k i'm not great at but probably anything longer than 2k i'm not very good at either so it's the ideal distance for me really now i know kiwi crews tend to have a, a higher cadence but when you came out in the single um in 2017 um you kind of blew everyone away by being able to maintain the speed that you could at that kind of rating so i'm looking at you you know i think 38 was quite low for you in terms of you know you were up to the second half of the race 39 40 through 2017 2018 
How did you develop that style of rowing or sculling? I think it, it definitely wasn't a conscious thing. I think it was more just an, a natural adaptation to try and go faster. I, I guess didn't have I don't have the raw power just to muscle along at a, a lower stroke rate. So to go faster, naturally, the the only thing for me to do was to rate higher and take more strokes. So it wasn't something I was even really consciously aware of. Like I'm not always looking at the the stroke coach when I am racing, and I certainly wasn't when I was uh, doing the that race in Poznan in 2017. Yeah, I was just trying to row as fast as I I could, and that was naturally, I guess, what happened and and how I ended up um, and have continued to rate really high. Well, you know that that was a phenomenal race that uh, that particular race in Poznan, and I, I wonder what your memories are of that um, of that particular race where you you basically blew the world's best time apart and and you know you're still holder of the world's best time 630 what's the point on it can you point remember seven, four. point what point seven four six thirty point seven four which, which is just such a a crazy crazy time i mean um what what are your memories of that race i think that was just one of those races that everything just goes right um and it just like I, I remember, I was slightly slow off the start, and I think I, I guess, could have sort of panicked or or whatever. But I just I had a lot of confidence in how fast I was going and training, and also yeah. thought, oh, well, if I'm I'm slow, I'm slow, so I might as well just row my race, which I did, um, and then eventually started moving back on everyone. But it just, like I just remember it feeling incredibly easy. And just one of those races, which when everything does click, it just does, it just flows and it does feel easy. And um, yeah, I, it, it was also my very first international race in a single. Are you kidding? Um, so no. I, I thought, oh, well, if this, the single's like this, like, just like, how could it possibly be so easy? And obviously, <laughs> something I found that it's not. It was just, I was in incredible form at, at that time and just, um, yeah, had had one of those races and that that just everything went right. You had an amazing second five hundred because you know you you were kind of back in third or fourth, and then through that second five hundred, three sixteen through the K, you're 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 killing everybody. Yeah, I think I just um, again like held the same speed speed the whole way, and I just had that rhythm where I I got onto it right from the start, and I think like that actually meant that I gave away a little bit out of the start, but because I just got onto that speed and just and held locked into that rhythm and held it right the way through that um yeah, it it looked like I went a lot faster in the second five hundred. I think it might have been one split faster or something, but it's also a tailwind and I think the the first five hundred was a little bit more sheltered. Um so yeah, yeah, yeah. The wind assistance it just sort of blew me along a little bit and I think it was within like one split um, each 500. So, did you have any idea through that race exactly how fast you were going? Uh, not really, other than looking at, um, I looked at my stroke coach in the first 500 actually, and I saw a 139, which is slower than world record speed, but they do seem to flicker a little bit. So, um, I guess I just forgot about the speed after that and just again focused on on rowing my own race so i thought oh well the time's a little bit slower than i thought it might have been um and then the the only other time i looked at it was about 500 to go and i saw a 136 yeah because I was like well that's obviously pretty fast and didn't know how long i'd been on that or whether it was just a again like a an extra fast stroke but um i sort of thought like if um it might have been around a 6.35 or something, and I thought that I would have been pretty happy with that. So if I just kept my foot down, um, I I could post a fast time, sort of around that 6.35 mark, which was about what I was doing at Carapiro before I went over yeah. um, to, to Europe for those, um, those World Cups. So, um, yeah, I guess when I looked at the screen, like um, afterwards, I was as blown away as I think you were in the commentary. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, again, like it didn't take, like I was pleased I had a good race. Like I, um, I won it by much more than I, I had expected to, or like, I, I just wanted to, again, like try and win the race or have the best race that I could. So, um, yeah, I, I guess it takes a while to sink in and, um, I guess it, it is like still probably the the best race I've had in terms of everything just going absolutely perfectly right. Um, but I guess it's also a hard thing because then trying to, I know that feeling and then trying to replicate that is also incredibly hard. Yeah, I was going to ask you, I mean, what, what, can, what were the ingredients that went into that, you know, in terms of... Um, you know, your training beforehand or your mentality or your, your flexibility, fluidness, is that something? I think it was just, um, I don't know, it's always so hard to pinpoint exactly what went right or what goes wrong when it when it doesn't go right because there's so many factors that go into making up a, perf a performance like that. Um, I think my training leading up to it was obviously incredibly good. Um, and it almost came out of nowhere as well. Like I, I actually had my wisdom teeth out a couple of months before that, and I had 10 days completely off training. Oh, wow. Um, so uh, that would have been, I think, uh, mid-April, um, and the, the World Cup was uh, like mid to late June. So, yeah, I had that time completely off with my wisdom teeth. Um, slowly built back into training over a couple of weeks um, and then I raced a, a winter series regatta race here in New Zealand and had absolutely no expectations going into it because I just yeah. had probably like a month of modified training leading into it um, and I came out on the first day and I think I was third on progs out of the New Zealand squad um, which is better than I'd expected the next day I was third again but if I'd gone one second faster I would have topped the New Zealand 10 wow. progs yeah and i came out on the last day and then i did top the progs out of and like absolutely not not expecting that at all so um i think that also gave me a lot of confidence but that possibly also came from having a, a bit of a break and actually letting my body rest and recover properly before that um i had had a really solid summer like the new zealand summer before and things were going well um I won the Sanguit Nationals and had a really good race. But, um, yeah, I think sometimes that that time off can really be key. Yeah. Um, Do you th I mean, is, is there a sense that, you know, because you're not the, you're not the, the tallest or, or, you know, the heaviest single sculler, that a lot of what you're doing is to, to go your speed, you're kind of on a very fine margin or edge. So yeah, yeah. you have to push yourself. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I always say like it for me to go that fast. Like I need to be so technically precise, and it only needs to be off a tiny little bit to make a uh, a significant difference. Um, but I think also like the training wise as well. It's sort of always being on that balance of really needing to train hard. And having a good solid consistent training block but they're not pushing it too far over which i think has happened sometimes as well so sometimes it's pushing too hard in training and going a little bit too far or sometimes it's being a little bit underdone as well so it's a really hard balance to get in terms of the the training and physical yeah build up but then also the um the the technical side of it as well and then i guess there's the also like the mental side of it and I after having that sort of 10 days off and building into it I think I was almost mentally refreshed and just like excited to go out there and attack it every day so um I think there's a, there's a lot of different um different factors in it you weren't tempted to follow that pattern again you know have some more teeth out so you could have another <laughs> I don't really want to pull any more teeth out. Not, not only because it's not the most pleasant thing to do, but also it probably hurt my bank account more. So yeah, yeah, I, I can afford that. But um, yeah, I, I think definitely it's always it's always a struggle, and I think being um, in a program 
like the, the New Zealand um, squad and um, also like with different coaches a little bit, uh, they, they probably get as anxious or more anxious than we do about missing training sessions and stuff and there's that expectation and stuff around um around the team and that that it was just like a really almost lucky um set of circumstances that i had to have that time off like yeah. under doctor's orders and stuff that i think then possibly put me in like some of the best shape yeah. of my life so i i know after that race i mean that that probably took quite a bit out of you even though you said it it felt sort of easy and fluid the whole way because you had to miss the diamond skulls at henley didn't you yeah, so I think like I even underestimated at the time how much it did take out of me, and because it just again it felt so easy, but obviously it wasn't because you know you yeah, had all those sort of rib problems afterwards, and I did manage to race Lucerne um, a few weeks later, but sort of under like with a fair bit of um, duct tape to sort of hold me together and sort of with like a bit of rib pain and stuff. So I managed to get through it and still had a really good race in, in Lucerne, but then, um, yeah, coming back to New Zealand really, really suffered because of it.